Quarter 1 Assessment Review. You can access this video and this review at srhsbio.wikispaces.com. First section is about some science skills. So how can scientists avoid bias when designing and conducting an experiment? So bias occurs when the scientists performing an experiment somehow influence the results in order to portray a certain desired outcome. So in order to avoid bias, uh, the scientists should remain open-minded, they should be honest, and use accountable record keeping. Additionally, the use of a control trial can help ensure that the results are only due to a change in one variable. The next question asks us to design an experiment to test the effect of pH on seedlings. So my independent variable is what we intentionally vary, what we intentionally change in the experiment. So for this experiment, it would be pH. My dependent variable is what I am measuring in the experiment that has changed because of the independent variable. So for this experiment, that's going to be the number of seeds that germinate. We could also do something like the height that the plants grow to. We can do growth rate. There's lots of ways we can determine the effect of pH on seedlings. So the control trial is a comparison. It ensures that the only reason the dependent variable changed was due to the independent variable. So for us, this is going to be distilled water with a pH of seven. So for our procedure, uh, we can prepare some petri dishes with 10 layers of paper towels, inspect radish seeds, make sure that there's nothing visually wrong with them, and place five uh, between the paper towels, five and six, and then add 20 milliliters of each pH solution. So we can use pH 2 for acidic, uh, pH 7 for our control, and pH 12 for basic. Place a lid on the Petri dish and put it inside of a plastic bag. That way the water doesn't evaporate. And then we can observe the seeds each day at the same time, and I just said at noon, uh, to record how many of them have sprouted. So my sample data table needs to have my independent variable and my dependent variable. So my independent variable is pH, so I have two, seven, and 10. And then my dependent variable is the number of seeds that have germinated for each day. Plants absorb red light to undergo photosynthesis. The wavelength of red light is 650 nanometers. How many millimeters is this? So we want to convert 650 nanometers into millimeters. So we're going to use a conversion factor, and we see on the screen that one millimeter is 1,000 nanometers. So I'm going to put units of nanometers on top, because nanometer divided by nanometer, the unit will cancel out. Millimeter is going to go on top because that's the units that I want my answer to be in. So one millimeter is a million nanometers. So we type this in our calculator and we get this number. And that number doesn't look very nice, so we can just move the decimal point over so that we can write this number in scientific notation. So whenever you write a number in scientific notation, you move the decimal until there's only one non-zero digit in front of it. So in this case, right after the six. And then you put the number of times that you moved it over, that would go as an exponent on the 10. And since this was a small number, it's a negative exponent. Next set of questions are about water and atoms. So use hydrogen bonds to explain why solid water, also known as ice, is less dense than liquid water. So basically, why does ice float in water? So if we look at the structure of the water molecules in a liquid, we see that we have these hydrogen bonds that are breaking and reforming. So this keeps this water molecules pretty close together. As the water cools, eventually those hydrogen bonds snap into place. So it makes this nice, neat lattice structure that's got a lot of holes in it. So because those hydrogen bonds are holding the water molecules apart, 
it's going to be less dense as a solid. So ice is less dense than liquid water, so it floats in liquid water. Consider an atom of magnesium. How many protons does it have? So the atomic number for magnesium is 12, which means that it's got 12 protons. We're going to assume to determine the number of total electrons, we're going to assume that the atom is overall neutral because the problem doesn't tell us anything about it having a charge. So what that means is that there must be an equal number of protons and electrons. So we've got 12 electrons. So the next question asks us to draw a diagram showing the electrons in their correct energy levels. So here's our nucleus. We already established that there are 12 protons in this magnesium nucleus. And we know that we have 12 electrons total. So the first energy level holds two out of those 12 electrons. So we still have 10 left. So we can draw our next energy level. The second energy level holds up to eight electrons. So eight of the 10 that I still have to place on there could go into that second energy level. So now I have a total of 10 electrons. So I'd still need to place two more. So our next energy level holds up to 18 electrons, but we only need to put two in there because we need 12 total. So when this atom forms a bond, is it going to gain electrons or is it going to lose electrons? So first, magnesium is a metal and metals lose electrons. So if we look at just an atom in general, atoms form chemical bonds in order to get a full octet of electrons. So they could form chemical bonds by sharing electrons in the case of a covalent bond or by transferring electrons in the case of an ionic bond. So this atom has two valence electrons. So it's easier for it to lose two than it would be to gain six. And if it did lose those outer two valence electrons, the next highest energy level is energy level two. And remember, we put eight electrons in that energy level. So that level has a full octet. So by getting rid of those two outer electrons, the atom is able to get to a full octet. Next set of questions are about macromolecules. So describe the difference between organic and inorganic molecules and give an example of each. Organic compounds usually contain carbon to hydrogen bonds. These include the macromolecules that are made by living things, such as our sugars, proteins, all of those would be considered organic compounds. Inorganic compounds do not contain carbon to hydrogen bonds. So for example, water, yes, it does have hydrogen in it, but there's no hydrogen to carbon bonds. Uh, sodium chloride is table salt. Carbon dioxide does have carbon, but there's not any carbon to hydrogen bonds. So we would consider that as an inorganic compound. Next question, let's look at the role and building blocks for the different macromolecules. So let's start with lipids. So the main role for lipids is going to be to provide store energy. And certain lipid molecules, such as cholesterol, are important for making hormones. The building blocks of a lipid, you've got three fatty acids that are held together by a glycerol. Those fatty acids can be saturated or unsaturated. So the saturated fatty acids are going to have all single carbon to carbon bonds. The unsaturated fatty acids have some double bonds between the carbons. So we call that unsaturated because those bonds are not saturated with hydrogen. That gives those unsaturated fatty acids kinks in their tail. So uh, saturated fatty acids, since they have those nice long tails, they can pack really closely together. Those are going to be solids at room temperature like butter. In the case of unsaturated fatty acids, those kinks in the tail prevent the lipids from stacking close together. So those are going to be liquid at room temperature. So those would be like uh, olive oil. 
The next type of lipid is phospholipid. So phospholipids are related to lipids, uh, but they have a very specific role and function, and that is to make up the cell membrane. The building blocks for a phospholipid, there's a glycerol, two fatty acids instead of three, and then there's a phosphate. So that phosphate group uh, forms this polar head where the two fatty acids form these nonpolar tails. So if you were to put this in water, those nonpolar tails are hydrophobic and they don't want to be exposed to the water. So they actually, the phospholipids arrange themselves so that those nonpolar tails are protected by those polar phosphate group heads. So uh, this forms our phospholipid bilayer, which is what makes up the cell membrane. So next we have carbohydrates. The main role for carbohydrates is going to be to provide quick energy. It also makes up certain structural components, such as the cell wall in plants or the exoskeleton, the chitin exoskeleton in, in insects. Um, the building blocks for carbohydrates is going to be monosaccharides. So a monosaccharide is a single sugar, such as glucose. If I link two of those together through a dehydration synthesis reaction, I can get a disaccharide, such as sucrose, which is table sugar. And if I repeat that many times and link together many glucose, I end up with amylose, which is a polysaccharide, also called a starch. Protein uh, does a lot of different jobs. In particular, enzymes are proteins that speed up chemical reactions. They're also involved in transporting substances in and out of cells. So the building blocks for a protein are amino acids. So proteins have very complicated shapes. They start out as a sequence of amino acids. And that sequence of amino acids can be created into a beta sheet or an alpha helix. And then those structures can be twisted and uh, folded on top of each other to form a three-dimensional structure. And then the quaternary structure would be the complex of the protein molecules together. So this one right here is showing hemoglobin. So it's got a very, very specific shape because proteins usually have very specific functions and that shape gives them their specificity. Next, we have nucleic acid. So nucleic acid, the DNA is going to be responsible for our genetic information. RNA is actually used as a blueprint to give the cell instructions on how to make proteins. The building blocks of nucleic acid are nucleotides, which are made up of a sugar, so it's either going to be deoxyribose in DNA or ribose in RNA, a phosphate group, and a base. So this could be A, T, G, and C in DNA, and in RNA it's A, U, G, and C. So the phosphate and the sugar form this backbone along which the bases are attached. So if we look at DNA, we've got that deoxyribose sugar, and it's double-stranded. If we look at RNA, it is ribose sugar, and it is single-stranded. And note that in RNA, we have that U, and in DNA, we have T instead. Next question, what are each of the following vitamins used for? So vitamin C is used for wound healing. Vitamin D is important in bone formation. And vitamin K helps to clot blood. Next section is about enzymes. So an enzyme is found in the stomach of a human, which is highly acidic. So let's talk about how this enzyme works. So Enzymes are proteins which act as biological catalysts, allowing them to speed up chemical reactions. They are folded into a very complex shape that allows their substrate to fit. So in this particular reaction, we see that I'm starting with two pieces as my substrate, 
and the enzyme connects them together in order to make my product. So maybe this is an enzyme that's responsible for uh, linking together those um, amino acids to make my protein or linking together, helping with that dehydration synthesis to link together those um, carbohydrates. Which conditions would allow this enzyme to function the best? So it's going to be whatever the normal conditions are where that enzyme is used. So in this case, because it is found in the stomach of a human, it's going to be the best functioning at stomach pH, which is acidic, and around body temperature. So why might the enzyme not work outside of these conditions? So enzymes have very specific shapes that are suited to a specific task. Outside of the normal conditions, that protein can become denatured, which means that they lose that particular shape that allows them to bind onto their substrate. Draw a graph that shows the functionality of the enzyme as temperature changes. So my independent variable is going to be temperature. That needs to go on the x-axis. And my dependent variable is going to be enzyme functionality. So that goes on my y-axis. And you want to show that we peak, we have the most enzyme activity around the ideal temperature, which is right around body temperature. So we can see from this graph that it functions uh, in the range of about 20 to 50 or so. Um, but it functions the best right around body temperature, around 37 degrees Celsius. Next question is, set of questions is about transport. So first, let's talk about osmosis and why the water flows. So if you look at this picture here, those green hexagons are actually glucose molecules. And we can see very clearly that one side of my membrane here has more glucose than the other. And in my membrane, there are lots of small little holes and the water is small enough to pass through, but those glucose molecules would be too big. So if we look around each of the glucose solutes, we see that those water molecules are bound um, and they are not free to diffuse. If you look at the two sides, one side has more of those solute particles, which means more of the water is bound up and there's less free water. So water is gonna flow where there is from where there is a high concentration of free water to where there is a low concentration of free water molecules. So an amoeba is single-celled freshwater organism and a diatom is a single-celled saltwater organism. So create a diagram that shows the direction of flow of water and describes changes that occur to the cell. So if I were to take my amoeba and place it inside some salt water, so let's just say that the amoeba inside is about 5% salt, but the salt water is about 20% salt. So this would be a hypertonic solution, hyper meaning above. So water would flow out of the cell due to the concentration gradient. So in that last slide, the 20% side would be the side that has more solute, which means less free water. So since there's more free water inside of the cell than outside, the free water flows out of that cell membrane. What if we do the opposite and we take some fresh water and put the diatom in there? So that diatom lives in a saltwater environment. So let's say that it's about 10% salt. And then the fresh water has a little bit of salt in it. It's only 3%. So this would be hypotonic, hypo meaning below. So in this case, water is again going to flow from where there's a lot of free water to where there is a little free water. So water flows into the cell due to the concentration gradient. This can cause the cell to swell and it might even take on so much water that it bursts open. And obviously that would be bad for our diatom. This diagram shows part of a cell membrane. So the phospholipids make up the bilayer. And inside, we also see a channel protein. So this could be something like an aquaporon that helps 
the water to diffuse. The water can't pass through the cell membrane, so it oftentimes will go through this channel protein to get in and out of the cell. If we look at one of these single phospholipids, there is a polar phosphate head, which is hydrophilic. That means water loving. And then there's these nonpolar fatty acid tails, which are hydrophobic. So whenever you put the, these phospholipids inside of water, they're going to arrange themselves such that the polar heads are going to protect those nonpolar tails so they don't come in contact with water. So how does this explain this func the structure of our cell membrane? That phospholipid lipid head faces water, protecting the fatty acid tails from touching the water. This forms a phospholipid bilayer, bi meaning two. Last question. Some students are conducting an experiment about diffusion. They place two drops of food dye into a cup of warm water and they time how long it takes to mix. So then they repeat this for a cup of cold water. So their data would look something like this. So I've got cold room and hot water. Uh, and the time to diffuse is going to be much slower in the cold water than in the hot water. So why is that? So diffusion occurs due to collisions of particles. In the hottest water, those particles are moving around a lot faster. So that means that those collisions will happen more often. So the dye will diffuse faster in the warmer water. What are some constants? So my independent variable is temperature and my dependent variable is how long it takes to diffuse. So everything else should be a constant. Everything we can think of, the amount of water, the kind of dye, the amount of dye, the stopwatch that we use, the type of beaker, the thermometer, the temperature of the room, everything else we can think of, we want to try to make those constant. A dialysis tube is filled with 40% salt solution. So draw a picture showing what would happen if the dialysis bag were placed in hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic solutions. So for each picture, indicate if the mass of the bag would increase, decrease, or remain the same if left in the solution for 24 hours. So let's look at hypertonic. Here's my beaker. And inside of that um, dialysis tubing there would be my 40% salt solution. So if this is hypertonic, then the outside solution must be higher concentration. So this means that water is going to leave the dialysis tubing. And if I were to weigh this after 24 hours, the mass of the bag would decrease because it lost water. What about for a hypotonic solution? So there's my 40% salt solution inside of the dialysis tube. And since this is hypotonic, let's say that the solution on the outside is 30%. This means that water is going to flow into the bag and that the mass of the bag is going to increase. Let's look at the last one, isotonic. So here, if my salt solution inside the tubing is 40, then the solution outside of it is also 40. So that means that water is going to flow both into and out of the bag, which means that the mass will remain the same. 